Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to the release of our new report titled Building Alliances and Competing with China, the Imperative for UAV Export Reforms. Now, the era of remotely potted aircraft, or RPA, proliferation is here, yet the United States resists, resists exporting these capabilities to support its allies and build partnerships that are critical to integrated deterrence. As a result, the United States is falling behind global competitors, most notably China, in using RPA exports to develop both relationships and achieve technological advantage. Current United States RPA export policies reduce opportunities to build relationships with other countries undermine its efforts to expand regional alliances, diminish U.S. diplomatic influence, and weaken our nation's industrial base. Unfortunately, these policies tend to benefit China, Russia, and other competitors who use their RPA exports to create venues that expand their influence. Failing to revamp its RPA export policies means the United States will weaken its relationships and influence in the very regions that we seek to promote stability and achieve core U.S. interests. This study argues that not only should the administration update U.S. RPA export policies, it should also aggressively pursue opportunities to share these capabilities with friends, allies, and partners. This can be done in ways that affirm the U.S. commitment to non-proliferation goals, regional stability, and other international norms. Now, to explain the issues and recommendations, we have with us Heather Penny, Senior Resident Fellow at the Mitchell Institute. And we're also fortunate to be joined by Paul Bshari, Vice President and Director of Studies at the Center for New American Security. Paul is the award-winning author of Army of None, Autonomous Weapons and the Future of War, which won the 2019 Colby Award and was named one of Bill Gates' top five books of 2018. He previously worked in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, where he played a leading role in establishing policies on undemand and autonomous systems and emerging weapon systems. So welcome, Paul, and thanks for joining us, and Heather, Let's begin with a summary of the project. And as a note to our audience, please feel free to raise your hand using the function on the app or submit a question in the Q&A window anytime during the discussion. So with that, over to you, Heather. Thank you, sir. And if we can get the presentation up, very good. All right. So um, one of the reasons why we embarked on this project was that this has been a problem that we have seen uh, for years now, where China and other nations have been exploiting our res resistance to exporting our remotely piloted aircraft technology. You know, and, and what we've seen within Ukraine only makes this even more urgent and really brings to the forefront, brings to light uh, how we are fundamentally missing the boat on, on being able to support our partnerships and our alliances in ways that really strengthen and and manifest our national defense strategy. This is even more important because as we look to the future towards other unmanned systems, for example, autonomous teaming aircraft or collaborative combat platforms, as we begin to move forward into that, those technologies, these policies, which really are, are outdated by more than 30 years, will have a, an impact on those technologies and our abilities to operate as a coalition. Slide. So this is just a sample video, one of many that you can find that show Ukrainian forces using their TB2 Bayraktar uh, aircraft to scout Russian locations and conduct precision targeting. So whether queuing other systems or dropping their own weapons, the TB2 aircraft have been very effective enabling the Ukrainian military to be successful against a much larger force. If anything, Ukraine's use of the TB2 has proven just how important unmanned aircraft are to our partners and allies. You can just consider the counterfactual. What if Ukraine did not have the TB2? 
I think in that alternate history, the Russians would have gotten a lot further in their efforts to seize the whole of Ukraine because the Ukrainian military would have struggled to complete these kill chains. Everything we know that remotely piloted aircraft do, from target discovery, identification, determining intent, and the other valuable intelligence that comes from that persistent ISR, to queuing other weapon systems or prosecuting targets themselves and fleeting windows, and finally, obtaining that crucial battle, battle damage assessment. We're seeing the value that RPA provide our partners and allies. What's frustrating though, is that the TB2 is a Turkish RPA. Now, don't get me wrong, the Bayraktar has performed outstandingly for Ukraine, but a larger, more capable US RPA could have taken those combat effects to a totally different level. And if Ukraine was operating those US systems, we could support them further like providing additional Hellfire missiles. Yet, despite how important these remotely piloted aircraft are to our allies and partners, the United States has taken a, a strong presumption of denial when it comes to exporting these systems. In other words, the US starts at no when allies and partners are seeking this kind of capability. Slide. There are many good reasons to export U.S. remotely piloted aircraft to our partners and allies. This kind of military transfer is a clear sign of U.S. commitment, which can extend deterrence and strengthen these relationships. It's crucial that we empower our allies and partners because with how small the Air Force is, we can't be everywhere. Air power is flexible, but we can't be in two places at once. And when our allies and partners are equipped with U.S. remotely piloted aircraft, it enhances our interoperability, our machine-to-machine -machine operations, and integration across domains. Because when we share the same tactics, techniques, and procedures, and the same information systems and data links, it enables us to operate seamlessly across the battle space. And an often undervalued aspect of this military export is what it provides to our people. When we export these systems, we also train our allies and partners, so we work with them. And this creates relationships at the tactical and the operational level. Fundamentally, a community of airmen that prove uh, successful to coalition operations. So equipping our allies and partners with US remotely piloted aircraft is a force multiplier for everyone. So when it comes to RPA, RPA exports, why is the State Department's answer usually no? Slide. Much of the State Department's resistance comes from the Missile Technology Control Regime, or the MTCR. It's important to note that this is not a treaty or any kind of legally binding agreement. It's an informal political understanding among signatories. And the purpose of it is to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. The logic behind the MTCR is that in addition to constraining the proliferation of the weapons themselves, Limiting access to the delivery mechanisms could also prevent the proliferation of those nuclear and WMD tech weapons. Remotely piloted aircraft got caught up in this because in the early 1990s, drones looked a lot like cruise missiles. So the table here shows how the MTCR classifies any delivery technology, primarily by range and payload. If it can fly over 300 kilometers and carry over 500 kilograms, it's classified as a category one system and thus is subject to a strong presumption of denial. This was really kind of to capture, you know, those Scud Bs, right? Examples of current category ones would be the RQ-4 or the MQ-9. Smaller unmanned systems, these category two, which you see on the right, would be more like the MQ-1 or the TB-2. And these have lesser constraints on their exports some have argued that that should be enough for our partners and allies. But we have to remember that there's a reason why we as the US transition from the predator to the reaper as fast as possible. Larger aircraft often have more military utility. Smaller systems are really just limited in their operational effects. For example, once we armed the predator, after two missile shots, you were out of weapons. So when you think about the challenges of supporting our allies in the Pacific, Larger aircraft are also our only option because you just simply can't get anywhere with these smaller category two systems. Yet despite the conventional development of remotely piloted aircraft over the last 30 years, they have never been removed from MTCR guidelines, whether they're category one or category two. Next. 
So from 2017 through 2020, the Trump administration did work to reform UAS export policy. And while they were unsuccessful in gaining the consensus of the MTCR members and adopting a speed definition of the guidelines, MTCR uh, modifications require full consensus. And instead of adopting that 800 kilometer per hour as an additional threshold for category one vehicles, uh, when that was rejected by the MTCR plenary, the administration applied this change to the US interpretation of the guidelines. In addition, the administration set out certain objectives to consider uh, when uh, export requests were uh, made by our partners and allies. The first was to increase trade opportunities for U.S. companies. And we have to note, this is not about profiteering for the defense industry. We, under, we need to understand that exports are crucial to maintaining the defense industrial base. Foreign military sales amortize costs to the U.S. They make our own systems more affordable. And ECFIN can help fund innovation and development for future capabilities. I mean, just look at the F-16 and the F-15 as examples of how foreign military sales have brought more advanced capabilities back to the U.S. warfighter. Secondly, the administration sought to bolster partner security and counterterrorism capabilities. Because after all, who doesn't think we're stretched pretty thin right now? We need to build up our partners because we just don't have the foresight it takes to do it all ourselves. We keep saying that we have to rely on our partners to get things done. If we do, then we need to be willing to give them the tools to do that. Furthermore, we need to strengthen our bilateral relationships. And part of what we're talking about here is developing those personal relationships across coalitions that we mentioned earlier. This allows us not only to achieve the interoperability and strengthen the diplomatic relationships, but it's also fundamentally about sharing our values about how to use these systems. Preserving our military advantage speaks for itself. And obviously, we want to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. But who actually thinks that RPAs are really being used as nuclear delivery vehicles? All of this sounds great. So where's the disconnect? The challenge is that the State Department is still employing the same decision calculus that they did in the past. They've been given the check, but they're refusing to cash it. These changes have done little to alter the State Department decisions when it comes to RPA export approvals. And why? We would argue that there continue to be misconceptions surrounding how remotely piloted aircraft are employed, and this biases the department towards the strong presumption of denial. Rationales that we heard during our research for this paper included concerns over how RPA exports would message to MTCR signatories and it would show that we were no longer serious about non-proliferation. There was a belief that these smaller category two systems were good enough, that RPA exports might set off arms races or even destabilize regions, and that RPAs were more likely than manned aircraft to be used to perpetrate human rights abuses. Importantly, these rationales were all expressed by members of the State Department or the foreign relations community not the military members. The military just simply didn't share these concerns. And that speaks to a tricky part of these issues, split jurisdictions over RPA export decisions. And that's exacerbated by these bifurcated views. We believe that these misconceptions, these mischaracterizations are a result of the State Department and the foreign relations community not understanding military RPA operations. Next. So let's understand that in a little bit more context and a little bit more depth. One of the RPA operators that we spoke with said that RPAs not only provide better precision and lessen the chances of human error, but in many cases, they're more capable platform to conduct kinetic strikes. A remotely piloted aircraft is operated and employed by a large team of people. It's not humanless by any stretch of the imagination. First off, the crew, the pilot who's literally flying the aircraft, and the sensor operator who's managing the sensors, they directly control the RPA. But there's also a team of intelligent professionals that is there with that crew who are analyzing sensor feed real time to advise and collaborate on subsequent employment decisions. And often, higher headquarters commanders who bring their own team of intelligence professionals, joint staff, and legal counsel they're also involved in any weapons deployment decision. Importantly, 
rules of engagement, risk of collateral damage, and other special instructions are factors in how they employ uh, these RPAs. So one could argue actually that early piloted aircraft are a victim of their own success. They've been so good at avoiding collateral damage in combat, that the American public is acutely attuned to any loss of innocent or civilian life in these strikes. The persistence of RPA provide other benefits over manned aircraft for certain strikes. In addition to their targeting confidence and ability to maintain positive target custody or target ID, they're able to exploit fleeting windows of opportunity. Unlike fighters or manned aircraft, which can have a very limited time on station and could be pressured to employ even when the conditions aren't quite right, the RPA team can bide their time and wait until they can optimize those conditions and minimize collateral damage. But bottom line, RPA operations, they're not killer bots. They can actually be the most precise and discriminating employment force that we have. Slide. Furthermore, the genie's out of the bottle. Non-proliferation efforts only work when the technology, when the technology is exclusive. But when everyone and anyone can de develop the technology, all that we're doing is creating a market vacuum that others are filling. For example, as of a couple of years ago, over 95 countries have active military UAV inventories, and that number has only grown since. Of these 95 countries, 36 are using large category one armed remotely piloted aircraft. So denying RPA exports, not preventing this technology from spreading. Instead, what it's doing is creating the space, the market vacuum for other, perhaps less responsible nations to sell their UAVs. And this market is giving those countries the funding and experience to continue to further the, de the development of their UAVs and create more advanced systems. We're seeing this right now in China. Next. So if the United States are, can export advanced technologies like the F-35 or the F-15, there really is no reason why we can't also responsibly export large armed remotely piloted aircraft. There are many steps in the review process for foreign military sales. And every, every military technology goes through this. Normal export processes involve robust stakeholder engagement from the National Security Defense Cooperation Agency to the lead military service that will support that aircraft and do that transfer and do that training to the Bureau of Political and Military Affairs. The State Department will then send Congress a letter of request from the nation and then a letter of authorization for Congress's final review and approval. So Congress also gets a vote here. And there are requirements and legal statutes that any export has to follow. Those are contained within the Arms Export Control Act, the International Trafficking and in Arms uh, Regulations, and conventional arms transfer policy. Again, any military sale has to follow and comply with all of these requirements and statutes. Furthermore, any military export also um, has end use monitoring. So how is that nation using those aircraft? And what are they going to do when they come to the end of that life cycle? Ensuring that we, and there's, we ensure that they comply with any restrictions or caveats that we impose upon that sale. We conduct scheduled inspections to make sure that, that all those articles continue to remain there. And we do physical inventories. And we also um, monitor the technical data. So understanding how responsible foreign military sales actually are through normal processes should help us understand that these provide sufficient guardrails for exporting remotely piloted aircraft. There really is no reason why we can export advanced uh, fighter aircraft like the F-15 or the F-35, but we have more restrictive policies when it comes to remotely piloted aircraft. Next. So we need to understand that again, these restrictive policies, treating these aircraft as if they're nuclear missiles, they actually weaken our partnerships and alliances and they diminish our own combat advantages. So as a result, we recommend the following. The administration should define unmanned aircraft as aircraft for the purposes of export. This is a really important distinction. 
As we said earlier, why is it harder for a partner or ally to procure remotely piloted aircraft than an F-15 or an F-35? Another important issue to highlight here is that unmanned aircraft are being conflated with weapons, not just the delivery vehicles of nuclear weapons in WMD. Take the switchblade, for example. The administration is calling the switchblades that they're exporting to Ukraine UAVs, when in actuality, they're loitering munitions. This only adds the confusion. We need to understand RPAs as aircraft, not weapons. And we shouldn't mix this up because it really, it really confuses our policy. We also need to be forward-looking and not restrict our definitions to just remotely piloted aircraft. While this has been the forcing function that's pressing the issue right now, we have to be able to posture our policies so that future aircraft, like collaborative combat platforms or autonomous teammates, manned and unmanned teaming, are also defined as aircraft for the purpose of, purposes of export, not weapons. Um, as we re redefine these, uh, the policies, we need to avoid the mistakes that we made in the 1990s. So we have to have future looking categories because we want to ensure that we're able to integrate these autonomous teammates and collaborative aircraft with our allies and partners as well. That will be essential as we look towards the future uh, with our national military uh, strategies and peer competition. Secondly, we need to assure others of the U.S. commitment to nonproliferation. Just because we're clarifying policy around unmanned aircraft does not mean that we're stepping away from our commitment to nonproliferation. And we need to work to create a broad consensus on how remotely piloted aircraft and autonomous aircraft in the future are exported and employed. The United States has established fairly strict employment norms, rules of engagement for employing these aircraft. And these platforms now excel at nearly surgical strikes with very little collateral damage. So they comply with our values surrounding human rights while at the same time being very effective from a military standpoint. And we should encourage other nations to adopt similar measures. Slide. And this goes with our next recommendation. Again, we hold certain values associated with unmanned systems and with military combat. So enhancing monitoring protocols and agreements on how our partners will use these aircraft could help allay some of the concerns that critics of RPA exports have. And these policy changes and efforts could actually allow the United States to re-engage with our partners and allies that have turned to other nations like China for their UAV needs, or alternately have developed their own to fill the void. We have to remember that it is in our national interest to export these aircraft, not only because they create better interoperability and integration with our partners and allies, but because it strengthens our own innovation base, amortizes our costs, lowers our costs, and helps us advance those technologies for the good of not just the United States, but our allies and partners as well. And finally, the administration should clearly communicate the value of exporting remotely piloted aircraft, both to the American public and also internally to their own policymakers. These are not killer bots of dystopian science fiction. There are many unfortunate misperceptions surrounding these aircraft that adversely impact export decisions and therefore our own national security. So being willing to explain the value of these platforms and the value of sharing them with our partners and allies will be crucial to strengthening everybody's ability uh, to promote uh, freedom, democracy, and our national interests around the globe. Slide. Thank you. Sir, back to you. Yeah, well, thanks, Heather, for that uh, overview. And Paul, what I'd like to do is offer you the opportunity uh, to offer a couple of words and uh, give us your perspectives before we dive into more specific questions. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you, General Deptula. Thank you, Heather, for having me here today. Uh, and really, congratulations, Heather, on an excellent report, um, one that is very comprehensive and addresses really a whole wide range of issues pertaining to U.S.-U.S. export policy, but more importantly, gets to some of the underlying misconceptions that have made this such a challenging issue for the last decade. I started working on this issue under Secretary Carter in the Pentagon. Uh, this has continued to be a difficult challenge to the Obama and Trump administrations, and one that unfortunately we're still wrestling with as a government, in part because of just some really fundamental misconceptions about the technology, and then about sort of the state of its proliferation. 
And I think, you know, one of the most striking things to me in Heather's presentation was that map, that there are already, um, really, when you count non-state actors, over 100 uh, you know, countries and non-state groups around the globe that have drones of various shapes and sizes today. Uh, and I think the example of the TB2 in Ukraine is such a, a really significant one because it points to how widely available this technology already is where the supplier is not um, you know, one of a very small handful of leading military countries. It's Turkey and uh, Ukraine has access to this technology. And it just shows how widely available drones are today and how much our export control policy is stuck decades in the past based on some really outdated misconceptions of where the technology is. And I think the most fundam fundamental misconception is this idea that somehow the U.S. has a monopoly on drones. Uh, we don't. Uh, they've been valuable for the United States military, and they play some important roles in our military operations, particularly counterterrorism operations. But we see that many, many other countries have access to drones, including armed drones, including larger, more capable systems. And you see that just because the U.S. has not been selling them abroad doesn't mean it's even really slow proliferation. The reality is that, as Heather mentioned, China has stepped in to that gap. China has been selling them abroad. Over 90 percent of armed drone transfers abroad come from China. Um, and so that has really shaped the global proliferation of this technology. Now, how should the U.S. respond to this? I want to take a step back for a second and just kind of reflect on some of the interests that the United States has. There's a couple of interests that are at play when the United States thinks about how it should approach drone exports. So the most important one is that the U.S. needs to retain legal and political freedom of action for how we use drones in our military operations. We've seen that they are a critical tool for counterterrorism operations, in some ways even more important today as we've transitioned away from these very heavy boots on the ground operations that we had um, in Afghanistan during the peak of the war in Iraq towards these much more lighter footprint or over the horizon operations. And drones are essential for that. Now, legally, that's fairly easy. The U.S. simply uh, you know, shouldn't sign some kind of agreement tying our hands about how we would use these drones. But politically, it's more challenging. Of course, the way that the U.S. has used drones in conflicts has been contentious in some circles internationally and domestically. And so the sort of broader political discussion around drones is one that we very much have a stake in. And how other countries use drones is going to change international perception of the technology and how it's used. And that will then reflect back on political considerations for the United States. So we have a stake in how the technology is used as it proliferates. We might not be able to stop the proliferation but we certainly can shape the context for its use. And that's where things like the 2016 International Agreement, the Joint Declaration on the Export and Use of Drones is really significant when we think about shaping some of this broader conversation about the use of drones around the world. Other considerations that the U.S. has include wanting to maintain a leadership position for the U.S. military in terms of an important new technology area how to make sure the U.S. stays ahead in drones as the technology continues to evolve. And we see a really highly globalized marketplace. We think it's really important, of course, that the U.S. uses you know, military capabilities, including drones, to enable our partners and allies. And we care about the norms behind these technologies as they're adopted overseas. Now, for all of these issue areas, it's not as simple as sell drones or not sell drones. Um, the answer is that for all of these areas, conditional exports are going to be in U.S. interest. And the answer is that there are going to be situations where it's in U.S. interest to sell drones abroad. And then there's going to be interest where it's not in U.S. interest to transfer them to certain actors or for certain types of applications. So the answer, you know, certainly is not going to be to set up a roadside kiosk and sell drones, including some of our most capable systems or armed drones to anybody who wants them. Like any other military technology, the answer is we should be selling drones abroad or transferring them to partners when it's in U.S. interest to do so. And there's a variety of factors that are at play, including strengthening non-proliferation regimes like the MTCR. 
the U.S. should remain in the MTCR. It's a very important non-proliferation regime that has not halted the proliferation of ballistic and cruise missiles, but it has made it more difficult for countries like North Korea to gain access to some of these technologies. So we want to strengthen the MTCR. At the same time, for these regimes to remain relevant, they're going to have to adapt to the realities of technology as it evolves. And UAV or RPA or drone, or whatever term you want to use, the technology today is very different than it was 30 years ago when the MTCR was created. And the reality is that we're going to have to adapt the regime and our interpretation of it to the state of the technology today. And one of the things that we've seen in particular is that unmanned aircraft technology have moved beyond what it was several decades ago, where really they were quite simple um, drones in the in the real sort of uh, almost pejorative sense of not being very sophisticated, not having a lot of capability, to now we're looking at true aircraft, multi-mission military aircraft that can perform a wide variety of functions that are piloted by a person remotely. And looking ahead into the future, we're seeing increasingly the adoption of optionally piloted systems, certainly that exists in the, the R&D space, and we're gonna see that increasingly adopted into military capabilities as well, that are, that are also gonna challenge sort of this distinction that the MTCR makes at present between how it um, controls unmanned aircraft um, and classifies them essentially as missiles restricting the transfer of them. So what does that look like for an optionally piloted system? Does that mean all of a sudden that uh, an F-16 um, is going to be controlled under the MTCR because we've demonstrated a QF-16? Um, we're gonna see this, this blurring of the lines and this use of unmanned aircraft as really normal military aircraft is gonna to continue to challenge this regime. And to make the regime viable, we're gonna to have to adapt it. Um, I very much agree with uh, Heather's conclusion that the, the answer here that the US needs to do to change its approach to the MTCR is to begin treating unmanned aircraft as uh, aircraft, not as missiles. It doesn't seem like a revolutionary thing to say unmanned aircraft are aircraft, but that's not how we're treating them right now. Um, and treating them as such, adopting the US interpretation, which the US could do unilaterally. Um, we don't need to reach consensus among MTCR states. That'd be great if we could do so, but we don't need to do so in order to change our interpretation of the regime. It's gonna be the right approach going forward that ultimately allows the US to transfer these types of systems abroad when it's in our interest to do so, and not have an export policy that today is, is really grossly out of balance, which was a balancing US interest. Thanks very much. Well, thanks for that, Paul, uh, particularly your last point. Um, and <clears throat> perhaps we can expand on that a little bit in uh, Q&A, but what I'd like to do now is dig into some of the points that you both have raised in uh, greater detail. Um, Heather, the Biden administration approved uh, recently the transfer of 100 switchblade loitering munitions to Ukraine. Um, some have called them drones. Uh, and is, is this evidence uh, that counters your argument that the United States is overly restrictive when it comes to UAV or drone exports? You know, sir, I'm glad that you mentioned that you call them switchblade loitering munitions, because I think that that's a really important distinction, as I mentioned in my presentation, is that, you know, they are not UAVs like the administration has called them. And this is one of those characterizations when we're when we blur um, the our language surrounding unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned aircraft with these loitering munitions, it confuses the public and frankly, it confuses um, decision makers and policy makers within the administration regarding what the appropriate policy is to apply to these. The fact that we uh, are transferring 100 switchblades to Ukraine is not evidence that the United States is, um, is is lessening up or it has the appropriate uh, policies with respect to remotely piloted aircraft or unmanned aircraft. First of all, we have to understand these switchblades, as, as you mentioned, they are loitering munitions. They, they can fly themselves further. They've got little winglets to pop out, um, but they are, they are one, way, one way vehicles, right? They are like little tiny cruise missiles. So on one hand, they do fall under that category two, which have lesser restrictions on them. 
but they are also not aircraft. So we need, again, to make the distinction between these munitions and aircraft, as Paul said, right? I mean, he just gave a very cogent argument on why we need to um, be much, we need to clarify our categories of these different types of capabilities because there are different types of policies that are appropriate and different types of considerations that are appropriate for each one of these capabilities. And when we blur those lines, it is not in our interest and we're not able to adequately uh, support our own national security interests or support our partners and allies. No, thanks for that. Um, now, Paul, you spoke a little bit to this, but in your view, uh, has the United States been too restrictive, too lenient, or about right in its approach uh, to uh, drone exports? Well, I think it's important to acknowledge that the U.S. has a range of competing interests here. Um, there's certainly a need to uphold norms of non-proliferation and strengthen the MTCR. There's a need to help benefit our partners and allies. There's a need to retain U.S. freedom of action for how we use drones. And in some cases, these are going to be in conflict. The problem has been that to date, the U.S. export policy has really strongly overly weighted this one component, which is how we respond to the MTCR at the expense of other things. And that's, you know, we, there are other areas where it's beneficial to transfer drones abroad, where we haven't been doing so. Um, one is that it's going to strengthen partners and allies the same way that we you know, transfer other military pieces of equipment, same, same true with drones, and that's a good reason to transfer that. It can strengthen the bilateral relationship. It can allow U.S. industry to remain competitive in a rapidly evolving area, and one that's very globalized. So there's this market that's evolving globally for drones, and when we're not engaging in the marketplace, we're allowing Chinese companies to basically dominate not just those bilateral relationships, which in many cases close U.S. partners, but also then dominate the marketplace, take those sales, drive them back into their R&D, and begin to move forward on the technology. But I think another component that's it's sometimes lost in this conversation is that if the U.S. cares about how drones are used abroad, and we very much should care how other countries are using them, we are going to be best positioned to influence how other countries use drones if we're the ones selling them to them. So if they're buying them from China, we have very little leverage over other countries, including close partners, about how they use those drones. If we sell them, then if we're concerned about things like avoiding civilian casualties and collateral damage, we can add training for their RPA operators as part of a condition of the sale. We can add end use restrictions if we need to about how they're employed. And so, you know, if the reality was that um, the U.S. had a monopoly on drones that maybe restricting, you know, their sale abroad wouldn't allow other countries to get access to them. But that's just not true. China's selling them abroad. And so if we really want to shape this landscape for how drones are used, then we've got to engage with others. Um, and I think that's really fundamental. We, you know, we circle back to that 2016 joint declaration. We could make U.S. transfers conditional on countries signing up to that and then adhering to that. That's a point of leverage for us, and it's one that we're not using to actually shape how this technology is used abroad and help bolster our concerns about human rights. No, that's great. Now, you talked a bit about this, but what then should be the U.S. approach toward uh, drone, RPA, UAV exports? I mean, the simple answer is that we should transfer them when it's our, in, in our interest to do so. Um, and we've seen successive administrations make changes to their U.S. export policies, trying to overcome these hurdles. The Obama administration did, the Trump administration did. We haven't been able to break through this deadlock inside the bureaucracy. And fundamentally, I think what we're going to need is a reinterpretation of the MTCR to get us to that point. Um, but when there are, just like any other technology, when there are advantages to us selling this to partners, then we should be willing to do so and not allow ourselves to trip over our own feet in terms of getting stuck in the bureaucracy. Well, thank you. Heather, um, speaking of differences from different administrations, the Trump administration changed some policies on RPA exports. Can you describe these changes and just what impact they've had on um, RPA export decisions? <laughs> 
So I addressed some of this in the in the presentation about how the Trump administration had changed our own understanding of what defined category one aircraft. And they added um, another threshold, which was 800 kilometers per hour. And then they also provided some policy objectives that would then guide whether or not uh, ex exporting these RPAs would be in our national interest. Because what Paul said is, is eminently just common sense, right? We should export these, these aircraft when it's in our national interest to be able to do so. But again, it really has not changed the way the State Department and the foreign policy community approaches uh, their decision calculus and what they value when it comes to exporting these aircraft. And I think it's largely because they are concerned about how this could impact uh, you know, um, perceptions across the globe of our commitment to nonproliferation. Um, they're concerned that uh, it could potentially be used in ways that are not in accordance with our values. But again, when we don't engage, when we're not the ones who are sharing this technology with, with our partners and allies, we're forfeiting that opportunity to influence how they use them, their own doctrine and their own rules of engagement. Now, it isn't going, you know, if we're going to export these capabilities, it's not necessarily going to, going to normalize adversary exports on their capabilities as well, because we have to realize when we create that market market vacuum by not participating, by not sharing these capabilities, these aircraft with our partners and allies, that that vacuum, that demand still exists. Those other nations, our partners, our allies, and others, they see the value of these aircraft. And so they're going to get them any way they can. And if they're not getting it from us, they're getting it from they're either building it themselves, which is more difficult to do. So by and large, they're buying it from China. And this provides an influx of cash into Chinese companies so they can continue to refine their capabilities, advance their own technology. And we're seeing that um, because the, the rate of, of advancement and development uh, in Chinese remotely piloted aircraft and autonomous aircraft is just astounding if you've been watching um, how they've been moving. But the other thing that it provides China is insight into um, the intelligence and operations of these other uh, other countries that have imported Chinese uh, remotely piloted aircraft. And it provides China also um, leverage over those countries. So it's strengthening Chinese bilateral relationships with nations that used to be our partners. So we need to understand that this isn't just about military capabilities. It is really about um, the balance of power and the balance of relationships and how how we're able to influence or not influence the use of these aircraft uh, in the end game. Yeah, the, as you're speaking, the example of uh, a Jordan comes to mind in the middle of Operation Inherent Resolve um, when we're uh, on the same coalition team uh, trying to uh, fight and defeat the Islamic State. Um, uh, Jordan wanted to purchase MQ-1s. The United States State Department turned them down, and so they, they turned to China. Yeah, uh, they, they so. purchase CH4s. And that actually, you know, prevents us from being able to integrate and operate with our partners, right? So we 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 couldn't integrate with, with Jordanian CH4s because we knew that China was gathering intelligence and collecting on those Jordanian operations and therefore would be collecting on us as well. So it, it really does drive a wedge in our ability to, to operate with our partners. Well, thanks, Heather. So, Paul, how should the United States approach the uh, MTCR? Yeah, well, let's let's roll up our sleeves and, and nerd out a bit on this uh, this you know thirty year old non proliferation regime that is uh, really so fundamental to this issue. Um, so, what is the MTCR? First off, I want to say I think the MTCR is a valuable non proliferation regime, and the U.S. should stay in it. We should look for opportunities to strengthen it and to adapt it to the technology as it's evolving so that it remains relevant going forward. And so we need to be forward thinking about how this technology is evolving so we don't end up with this current problem getting worse over time where the regime just doesn't fit the reality of the technologies. Now, it's worth acknowledging, first off, it is not a legally binding treaty. So the U.S. is not bound legally to adhere to the terms of the MTC arts, Political declaration, it's one that we want to make sure that from a political standpoint, we're strengthening, but it doesn't actually tie our hands. Second of all, MTCR does not actually prohibit transfer of any systems. 
that divide systems into these two categories, category one, category two, larger systems with greater range and payload, there's a strong presumption to deny transfer of them. That's not legally binding anyways, but even if you follow the guidelines in the MTCR, it doesn't say you can't transfer these more capable systems, it just says that the starting position should be a strong presumption to deny transfer, which you could overcome in certain situations. So the US can transfer systems under the MTCR, including larger, more capable UAVs like Global Hawk or Reaper. MTCR does not prohibit that, um, but we haven't been able to overcome that strong presumption of denial internally to the US government for a variety of different reasons about how we're uh, interpreting the regime and then some misconceptions about it. Um, but uh, certainly having spent a lot of time working on this and seeing multiple administrations struggle with this uh, regime and the way it's being interpreted inside the US government, I certainly think that a reinterpretation of how we approach unmanned aircraft is going to be a better approach both today and going forward to future proof us against some of the realities of optionally piloted systems and how they're going to start to you know, capture up what previously have been manned or crewed aircraft. Um, we certainly don't want those to all of a sudden get captured under the MTCR because we put on an optionally piloted capability. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. And so you know, a reinterpretation of what falls under the MTCR, what meets the definition under the MTCR of a missile, of a UAV, um, is going to be important. I think the cleanest place to make that distinction is between recoverable two-way systems as aircraft and one-way systems as missiles um, that would fall, that look more, much more like a cruise missile, uh, things like a loading munition, for example. Um, and we're going to have to find a way to, to change the U.S. interpretation of this in order to really make this regime viable going forward. Well, thanks, Paul. I uh, appreciate that. And there is so much more to discuss with this. But what I'd like to do is uh, move on right now to uh, audience questions. Um, so we're going to open the session to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, and please feel free to direct your question to... Uh, um, either uh, Paul or uh, Heather. And as a reminder, you can participate uh, either using the raise hand function on the app. And uh, when I do call on you, please unmute your mic, state your name. Uh, and, and so let's jump right in with that. Um, we'll start with a couple of uh, text questions. Um, here's one from uh, retired Colonel Mark Tapper. Um, good to see you on board this morning. Uh, tap uh, and uh, the question is an open one. Are you advocating for blanket RPA sharing with allies to include stealth remotely piloted aircraft to close allies? Or um, would you induce, I mean, the implication here, um, or would you still hold some restrictions over these type of vehicles? Well, I think it comes down to uh, our, our interests, right? Is it in our interest to be able to share uh, stealth RPAs with our allies? And I think that we've already have good precedent for sharing stealth technology. Just take a look at F-35. So as we've seen stealth um, become, again, one of these technologies, which is not exclusively uh, uh, owned by the United States, we need to take into consideration uh, who we should share that with. Now, this isn't a blanket out for everybody. Again, it comes down to being discriminating regarding uh, what are what the needs of our allies and partners are, how they will how they plan on using it, and what's in our interest, and how we plan on operating and integrating with our partners and allies. So it's an it depends answer. I know that might not necessarily be. Um, uh, what what uh, what Mark was looking for, but I think that it does come down to what is in our interest. Paul, Paul? no, I totally agree. I think it's going to depend on the um, which ally we're talking about and which military capability. Just like in other areas, the you know most capable systems. No, we're going to want to withhold that for ourselves um, so that the U.S. still has a qualitative advantage over others. But particularly for very close allies and partners. Um, countries like uh, the UK, Australia, Japan, and other close allies, um, are we going to be willing to sell some more capable systems uh, than we're doing today? Absolutely. And I think the F-35, as Heather talked about, is a great example of this, 
Um, if we're selling it after we five, it's just really hard to make the case that we shouldn't sell something like a Reaper or a Global Hawk. Um, and certainly that does suggest that some degree of stealth uh, technology is something that we already are capable or are comfortable with transferring to some close allies. Right, here's a follow on from Mark, which is kind of an interesting question. Is there not an opportunity to drive change to the MTCR by binning manned aircraft sales with unmanned aircraft sales? After all, technology now available makes turning an F-16 into an unmanned aircraft somewhat nullifies the MTCR arguments for limiting range and payload, no? Well, uh, I, I think Paul uh, answered this, this question uh, you know, very articulately earlier, right, by saying that if we were to, you know, if we're, if we're going to blur those lines and suddenly manned aircraft, because they are optional and could be turned into unmanned, now fall into the MTCR, we're falling back into that strong presumption of denial and we've already seen how this has restrained, um, unfortunately due to misperceptions and mischaracterizations, our willingness to be able to share these types of technologies. So um, I, I think that it's important that we understand that aircraft, again, uh, vehicles that are recoverable, right? They're not one way, they're not weapons, but we can, we can bring them back and reuse them, that we define those as aircraft. And then we look at the very, rational point of what is in our national interest, what are the needs of our partners and allies, how are they going to use them, what's the appropriate technology for them, and how will we operate with those partners and allies. That really needs to be the decision calculus, not this let's start with no and then have to overcome misperceptions about how these will be used. So I don't think that that's the best way to be able to move forward because we have to understand that in order to strengthen the MTCR, uh, it, we need to do as much as we can to adhere to it, right? And as we see these, these platforms being, uh, you know, it was, as we see our adversaries proliferating this technology, that's actually weakening the MTCR. So if we really want to stay committed to non-proliferation, we need to, uh, again, uh, take this definition as aircraft so that we can remove these platforms from the MTCR. Okay, here's one uh, from uh, Doug Berkey. Uh, clearly, the issue has festered for a long time. One would think that Ukraine would have pushed the State Department to consider reforms. Even the Trump administration struggled to push states' frozen middle bureaucracy. What's it going to take to push genuine consideration of rational reforms across the line? Paul, why don't you take that one first? I don't know. I mean, that's such a great question. Now, I, I feel uh, the question, you know, the, the first answer, because I feel the frustration having been working on this for uh, about a decade now, because you know, sometimes it's like beating your head against the wall, because we've seen successive administrations change their policy to try to open up some space for more exports, and then nothing happens, right? So there's kind of this two stage process of, okay, we need to change the policy, whatever that is, again, Obama administration changed their policy, then the Trump administration, and then there was discussion about the speed issues. You know, we're talking today about reclassifying uh, unmanned aircraft as aircraft, and not a revolutionary idea, but to try to free up the space. But the second piece of any of this is you actually have to then approve these transfers. And for whatever reason, they keep getting stuck. And there is kind of this underlying mindset that I do want to acknowledge here, which I think is, is just it's based in this misunderstanding that the U.S. somehow has this monopoly on drones. We don't. And that, you know, I want to go back to that map that Heather showed at the beginning. I mean, that speaks volumes. This is the reality. This technology is spreading abroad. Now, we can stick our head in the sand and we can pretend that this isn't happening, but it is. Or we can say, how do we shape this trend? How do we make sure that we stay at the forefront of this rapidly evolving technology? How do we shape how it's used? How do we make sure that China's not undercutting our relationships with close partners like Jordan? How do we make sure that we have interoperability with our close partners? And all of that suggests that we're gonna to have to actually just get to the place where we're willing to make these transfers. But I think it's, yeah, there's policy issues that we need to do to change our interpretation, but it's also kind of a real underlying shift in mindset, waking up to the reality that, you know, that, that 
sort of close hold that the U.S. had. There was a fleeting moment in the early 2000s where the U.S. had the lead on this technology. And other countries didn't have access to the same capable UAVs as the United States. And it really took a few years and it was gone. And now we're going to have to adapt to the reality of where the technology is today. I, I here's totally agree. Bit, oh. Go ahead, Heather. I was just going to jump on uh, what Paul said, because I, I, I think he is so spot on with, with that, that frozen culture, right, um, with the mischaracterization. And I think the only way that it's going to move once you open up the policy, once you change, I mean, we've already done what we can to open up the policy, right? But changing the definition can be really important. In addition, it's going to take leadership. It's going to take strong leadership to drive this down into that frozen middle. No, that's great. Um, he, here's one that's uh, kind of interesting from uh, Mr. Richard Sullivan. Um, what is the your position on autonomous vice remotely piloted aircraft systems? So I think we made clear that the re one of the reasons why this paper and why this now to redefine remotely piloted aircraft um, as aircraft, right? Not, not as cruise missiles is because we are being forward looking towards autonomous aircraft. And again, this is going to be something that, first of all, we need to mature for our own, uh, our own military. So we're on the cusp of this technology and we still need to um, grasp exactly how we're going to use it, what their military advantages are, what those operational concepts are, um, and how those integrate with our manned platforms, with our command and control. So that's still a technological cusp that we're on ourselves. I, I think that once we define those as aircraft, the decision of calculus is the same for remotely, for remotely piloted aircraft, right? Um, who are our partners and allies? Uh, who has a need? Who has the ability to employ them? Who will employ them in a, in a way that is, is consistent with our national interests and our security objectives within that region? So I think that we can treat autonomous systems just like we treat other military technologies. Uh, at this point, I don't, I don't think that there's going to be a, a need to, uh, to really restrain and restrict that. Um, any more than we would in terms of the technological considerations that we have for some of our other capabilities. Because I'll tell you what, we certainly do not have an exclusive hold on autonomous technology. Just like remotely piloted technology, we are seeing autonomy proliferate throughout the globe. And if anything, we're seeing China has an advantage on us. Paul, I know you've done a lot of work in the autonomous space. What are your thoughts? Well, I think you make a great point that autonomy is so widely proliferated and so available, really even on the commercial market. You could buy a DJI quadcopter. It's quite a bit of autonomy. There's autonomous takeoff and landing and some very crude obstacle avoidance. You can track and follow moving objects. So you get that great you know, photo shoot of somebody skiing down a mountain slope. Um, so it has a lot of autonomous features that exist really out in the commercial marketplace. And we need to adapt to some of that reality. Um, I think it's important to think about autonomy as a characteristic of a military system like propulsion, stealth, communications that are going to exist in degrees of capability. So it's not a binary sort of is it autonomous or is it not. Um, there are going to be degrees of autonomy. We certainly have some elements of autonomous functionality in aircraft today, including uh, manned or, or crewed aircraft, uh, automatic ground collision avoidance systems is an autonomous function on you know, some F-16 aircraft. So, you know, and it's been used uh, in the real world, saving lives. And we're gonna see more autonomous capabilities incorporated into both manned and unmanned aircraft uh, and other military systems over time going forward. Now, are we gonna be willing to sell maybe the most high-end, most capable autonomous systems? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on how difficult it is and what the capability is. It depends on who the partner is gonna sell it to. Um, but in some ways, these are like the opposite of stealth technology in that uh, it's so widely proliferated, it's so available on the global marketplace um, that, you know, the answer is going to be that if we don't sell autonomous systems, uh, others are going to have access to this themselves. And so we need to adapt to some of those realities. Well, um, thanks very much, uh, Paul and uh, Heather. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of uh, Mitchell Institute's rollout.
of our study titled Building Alliances and Competing with China, the Imperative for UAV Export Reforms. Paul, thanks again for joining us. Heather, it's always a pleasure. And on behalf of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies and all of AFA, we wish you all the best as you work to best serve the nation's defense. And from all of us at Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day.